evening, I'm Sarah Watson, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's show, Lincoln and the African American Voting Rights. Lincoln's last speech was interpreted as optimistic by African Americans across the nation. But for the free black community in New Orleans, there was a special connection. Brian Mitchell's presentation tells us the story not only of the last speech, but also of the South's road to military occupation and universal male suffrage. Brian Keith Mitchell is a native of New Orleans and was formerly an associate professor of history at the University of Arkansas, Little Rock, and an associate faculty member at the Anderson Institute on Race and Ethnicity before leaving in the spring of 22. He now currently serves as the director of research and interpretation for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. For more information about the Looking for Lincoln conversations, visit our Looking for Lincoln Facebook page. It's now my pleasure to introduce Brian Mitchell. Hello, uh, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. And today I'll be talking about a particular group that I'm assuming that most people have never heard of. Um, it's called the Friends of Universal Suffrage and their pursuit for voting rights and how that pursuit for voting rights um, will take them all the way to Abraham Lincoln's White House. Okay. Most of you are familiar with this image uh, that appears on the screen. Um, you probably have seen it once or twice in your life. It's a very popular image uh, that came from a popular uh, periodical of the period. Um, the image was done by an artist by the name of Alfred R. Wood, and it's titled The First to Vote. Um, this image graced the covers of Harper's Weekly on November 16th, uh, 1867. And there are a lot of things that are really, really important about this image. Uh, first of all, it commemorated the first occasion in which uh, African-Americans voted in Virginia. And that election takes place in 1867. Uh, when we talk about the participation and what that participation looked like, um, there were over 105,000 uh, African Americans that registered to vote. And of those 105,000 African Americans who registered to vote, 93,000 of them actually voted and participated on election day in October of 2016. October 22nd, 1867. There are a number of other things that we can point out about this image. And one of the things that I want you guys to do is I look at the figures that are in the forefront. Most prominently, there are three African Americans. Um, the very first one to place the, uh, his ballot into the voting bin is an African-American who has tattered clothes. And if you look in his pockets, there's a hammer and chisel, and he's wearing the garments of a former slave. Directly behind him is a well-dressed African-American representative of that free black population that existed in antebellum time that had now come to the forefront and is having their opportunity to vote also. And behind this individual is an African-American who's donned an American uniform, a Union uniform. Uh, prominently on his chest is a medal. So I want to move one slide up so we have some idea of what these figures are. So there's the freedman, the free person of color, and the soldier, all representative of all the segments of African-Americans that existed in 1867 in the nation. To, be, to begin to explain this pursuit for voting rights, I'll take us back to December of 1863. In December of 1863, uh, free black men in the city of New Orleans will form a union and begin to assemble. Uh, they were called to form this union by a local newspaper that was run by a free black man of color by the name of Louis Rudinez. Rudinez himself um, was the example of 
the very epitome of what elite free black African American society was. His father was black. His his father was white. His mother was black. He was educated in France. He was one of the uh, most equipped physicians in the city, and he owned the newspaper, the Le Union. Um, in the Le Union, he called for a grand assembly at Economy Hall, which was an African American uh, gathering place. Um, and African Americans, particularly those free blacks, came in great number to Economy Hall to meet. There were over a thousand of these free blacks that met in December of 1863. And at the conclusion of their meeting, more than a thousand of them will sign a petition demanding that they be considered for voting rights. In that proclamation, they proudly proclaimed, we are men, treat us as such. And they signed this, position, this petition and then have a vote on who will deliver the petition to President Lincoln. Now, this was an extremely shrewd move. They realized if they send the wrong people there, um, the people at the front door may not even let them in. So they had to be extremely um, selective about who they chose to send. And we'll take a look at the men that were chosen. The first of the two men that was, were chosen was a man by the name of Jean-Baptiste Rudinez. Rudinez was the younger brother of the noted doctor and newspaper owner of the Le Union. He will later open a second newspaper uh, called the New Orleans Tribune. And in fact, the New Orleans Tribune is America's first black daily newspaper. Uh, like his brother, he uh, his father was a white male. He had been educated in France. He spoke fluent English. And more importantly, he looked the part. He looked and sounded the part. Extremely educated. And if you look at the photograph, what you'll discover is he doesn't look phenotypically black. He's got light skin, straight hair, and there's a particular reason why they do this. The second man that was selected was a man by the name of Arnold Bertno. And Arnold Bertno was born in New Orleans, like Rudinez. His father uh, was a white man, and he was a former soldier. He had been a part of the Native Guards. He had joined the Union Army very early after the taking of New Orleans. He had served, and if you remember uh, the Native Guards' history, he fights at the Battle of Port Hudson, the first siege that um, African Americans will participate in. And he's a wine merchant. So he's extremely educated, extremely cultured, well dressed, but very much like Rudinez. He appears phenotypically white, straight hair, light eyes. If he walked into the room, no one would recognize him uh, or discern that he was African-American. We don't have any record of what was said between the two men and Abraham Lincoln. We know that they were allowed an audience. And we know that this audience made some impression upon Lincoln. Um, we know this because on April 11th, 1865, in Lincoln's last address, he mentions Louisiana, particularly educated men and men that had participated in the service. He maintained that those men um, should be considered for uh, voting rights, elective franchisement. And uh, so we, we know that these two individuals and their visit made some impact upon Abraham Lincoln. We also know that in the audience that day, there was a guest who was listening very intently to the words that um, Lincoln was saying. And this guest is very well known. Um, he would have been very well known to anyone who was there. Uh, he was a nationally recognized actor um, from a very uh, exclusive acting family. And he believed uh, quite wholeheartedly that he could save the, con the Confederacy and its cause. Well, there are a number of motives 
of which uh, Booth had in being in the crowd. First, he was feeling out the president. He had already hatched a plan to uh, kidnap the president, smuggle him back to Richmond in hopes of restarting the war and um, winning support for the Confederate cause. However, after hearing the speech that was said, Booth is distraught. And he realizes that his plans have not gone far enough. So after hearing the address, particularly the words of empowering uh, African Americans, Booth uh, adapts his cha his uh, plans, amending them from kidnapping to an assassination of the president. We also know that he will go through with this assassination at Ford's Theater. However, this doesn't dissuade the African-American men in New Orleans. And in fact, they will call additional meetings after the assassination. Uh, a meeting was called at Economy Hall on May 23rd, 1865. And the person who will lead this meeting, the person who will serve as the chairman uh, for this new meeting um, will be an, an African-American. He looks nothing and, and this is really important. He looks nothing like the two delegates that were sent. If you remember, phenotypically, the two delegates that were sent, Rudinez and Berno, were white. Um, but if you look at Dunn, uh, in fact, uh, newspapers would do joke about Dunn's appearance, uh, often saying he was black as an ace of spades. Um, he appears to be an African-American. There's no way you could fool someone into believing that he was a, a white man. So he would serve as the president of this new group. The purpose of that meeting um, was to actually uh, formalize the organization into an organization that could uh, push and protest for uh, suffrage rights. Uh, and, the, and suffrage rights exclusively for Blacks. Initially, the suffrage rights were only going to be ex, uh, afforded to those individuals that had served in the military and those individuals that had been free before uh, emancipation. But eventually, their platform would be expanded to include the freedmen. Um, at that meeting, they will draft a resolution when they hear that Solomon P. Chase will be visiting the city of New Orleans. And they'll send this resolution to Chase, inviting him to come and speak to the group. They'll point out in that resolution that they had been loyal, many of them serving in the Native Guards, and that they had fought for the country. And they will compare themselves to the Democrats of Louisiana, pointing out how disloyal and treasonous their white counterparts had been. Despite having this... Uh, this signed petition and this invitation, the Chief Justice uh, will decline meeting with the group. However, he would um, send back his praises and welcomes and um, would ask them to continue on with their efforts, but would not present himself publicly before um, the gathering. It's at that meeting that one of the delegates will declare that a line of demarcation had to be drawn between those people, particularly whites, who were supporters of universal suffrage and those who were enemies of universal suffrage. And this idea of universal suffrage is where the group will get its name and that statement is from where they will derive their name. And the, their name, the name of the organization will be the Friends of Universal Suffrage. As the, the Friends of Universal Suffrage begin to gain momentum, and they largely begin to gain momentum with um, the discussions of the 14th Amendment and the idea that the 14th Amendment is being argued inside of Congress at the time. Um, in preparation for possible voting rights and recognition, uh, the delegates will form a convention and they'll have this convention declared to meet at Mechanics Hall. 
When the delegates arrive at Mechanics Hall, the mayor of the city, and you have to remember that this is during the Johnston and the Johnson administration, um, the mayor of the city will ask the police officers and the fire departments to march in the city. And they had planned a very organized um, attack on Mechanics Hall. And when a siren in the city sounded, the police acting in collaboration with the fire department were told to attack Mechanics Hall. The attack on Mechanics Hall was devastating. Over 50 African-American delegates were killed. So more than 200 African-American attendees were wounded. That was the second attack in two months. The first attack being um, the riot in Memphis that will take place that same summer in 1866. These riots will uh, cause Congress to expand its military hold on the former Confederate states, believing that at any point these states could erupt into insurrection again. As Congress puts in uh, measures that will have the South divided into five districts, these five districts become marshal marshalized, and the generals that are leading those five districts become the law there. Students just ask me all the time if voting rights weren't extended to African Americans until 1870, then how were how were there these elections in 1868? And one of the things that I have to uh, explain to students is there was a great distrust on the part of Republicans with the leaders in the South, largely for these two. Uh, riots that took place in the summer of 1866, the riot in Memphis and the Mechanics Hall riot. And also the investigation showed that there was direct coordination with former Confederates and leaders in the post-war government, those Democratic leaders in the post-war government. So knowing that, that there was this distrust for the Democrats, um, many of the generals began removing uh, democratic political figures and replacing them with appointees. And this was a perfect attempt for them to find a group of Americans who would be loyal and loyal only to the Republican Party. And they looked to the African American population for these leaders. Many of these leaders had come from the church and the most prominent African American church in the city of New Orleans at the time was St. James African American Episcopal Church. It was the largest AME church uh, pre-Civil War in the Deep South. Um, at its height, it had over 4,000 members, and it's a small church, and it still exists. It's still used in the city. And they looked to the ranks of the Prince Hall Freemasons. Both of these organizations were well-structured. Most Both of these organizations had a leadership, and that leadership had permeated the Friends of Universal Suffrage. So most of the Friends of Universal Suffrage uh, were part of parts of fraternal organizations, many of which were in the Prince Hall Masons. Um, the chairman that I showed, Oscar James Dunn, this is his tomb, and if you look at his tomb, you uh, see a blazon, the compass and square of the, the of Freemasonry there. And if you read uh, what's uh, chiseled onto the tomb, you notice that he had served as lieutenant governor from 1868 to 1871. He had also served as grand master of the Masons from 1864 to 1867, he served as Grand Master twice. They, he was Grand Master while he was sitting Lieutenant Governor also. So um, from 68 to 71, he also served as uh, the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge there. In 1868, um, the governing officers, the commanders, 
that were governing Louisiana decided to put an election forward to come up with new candidates for uh, governor, lieutenant governor, and to fill the vacancies in the legislature. Realizing that they couldn't trust the Democrats, they enfranchised African-American voters. And this is an image, and it's supposed to be of New Orleans having their elections. And what you see are African-Americans not only voting, but participating at the polls. And this is a, a very important scene because you have to ask yourself, how do you organize? How do you register uh, so quickly? Um, all of these people who are enslaved, many of them who cannot read. And the way they did this was to start within churches and to use the mechanisms that had already been established, the avenues that had already been established through Freemasonry to establish registration uh, areas throughout the state for African-Americans. Um, the man had been chairman of the Friends of Universal Suffrage, uh, Oscar James Dunn, volunteered to organize these, being the, the head of uh, the Black Freemasons in the state. And not only did he uh, volunteer to organize the registrations, he also volunteered to pay the entire expense that would incur in registering all of the free Blacks in the state of Louisiana. So the whole cost of registration was incurred um, by this individual. And this is an image of him. Um, this image was taken when he visits the, uh, he becomes the first African-American politician to make a junket to a, a, a inauguration. And this is Grant's, he takes this while he is visiting Grant in the spring of 1869. One of the few mistakes that Dunn acknowledges making before his death was in choosing an ally. And um, the Friends of Universal Suffrage had used race as a way to get to, uh, to, get to Abraham Lincoln. And they realized that uh, it might benefit them to have white allies that were capable of bringing the registration books of black voters to Washington, D.C. and presenting them to the president. The individual who presented himself as an ally um, was a man by the name of Henry Clay Warmoth. Warmoth was a native of Illinois, um, and he had been a union colonel. Uh, quite notably, he was dishonorably discharged by Ulysses S. Grant for cowardice. However, he appealed his discharge to Abraham Lincoln on the basis of being from Illinois also. And um, Abraham Lincoln withdrew uh, his dishonorable discharge. After the war, he becomes a judge in Texas. But there, too, he runs into a, a number of problems as cotton uh, is being sold on the black market, and he's accused of being involved in these illicit sales. So he makes his way to New Orleans penniless. And it's in that period that he introduces himself to Dunn, who is chairman of the Friends of Universal Suffrage. He's a young man, and as you can see in this photograph, he's not very old. In fact, when they put him up as a candidate for as a candidate for governor, he's so young, he doesn't meet the state requirements. So what they have to do is actually amend the, the constitution, changing the age in which you could become governor of the state of Louisiana to afford him the chance of being governor. So there's a great deal of trust that is placed in Henry Clay Warmoth. A Warmoth ultimately will betray this trust. Uh, one of the first acts that uh, African-American legislatures will do is try to pass a civil rights bill that will afford African-Americans equal civil rights to whites. And even though he had been placed in power, even though he was a part of the Friends of Universal Suffrage, even though uh, 
African Americans had fought and changed the Constitution to enable him to serve as governor. When this bill gets to his desk, he says, I don't think you guys are prepared for this. And he refuses to sign the bill. Um, this will cause a huge schism in, inside of the Republican Party in the state. Um, Dunn was, uh, I must point out that Warmoth was not the only candidate uh, for governor of the state, um, particularly the free black Afro-Creole community put forth another candidate. And the candidate that they had put forth on the slate was a man by the name of Francis Dumas. And Dumas had served as a major, one of the highest ranking officers during the war. He had been um, the son of a white planter and himself had owned uh, quite a few slaves, which he um, emancipated at uh, when uh, Union forces took the city of New Orleans. So after emancipating, um, after emancipating his own slaves and participating in the war, um, the community put him up as a candidate. He was educated, um, very much like Rudinez and Bertino. Uh, however. He had this stain on him of having been a former slave owner. So it was very, very hard for him to elicit the support of the newly enfranchised uh, freedmen. And that takes us to uh, another carpetbagger. And quite often when we talk about carpetbaggers uh, that are in the South, Northerners that go to the South to participate in politics, and many of whom become very rich from their participation in politics. Uh, one is a gentleman by the name of a PBS Pinchback, Piccaninny uh, Pinchback. And Pinchback was from Ohio. Um, like many of the other men that I mentioned, phenotypically, he uh, looks, he doesn't look African American, thin hair, very fair skin, very light eyes. Um, he had come down, participated in the Civil War as part of the Native Guard, had resigned his commission, and wanted to participate in politics there. He rises very, very quickly in the Louisiana political machine, largely uh, because he's a fire next time. It's sort of firebrand uh, charisma when he's speaking. He speaks to the freed people, often uh, uh, saying that he will demand rights for them. Um, he will be the individual that will nominate Oscar Dunn for lieutenant governor. So Oscar Dunn, the man who had been chairman of the Friends of Universal Suffrage, will be nominated for the post of lieutenant governor. And this nomination is extremely important because Dunn is a newlywed. He gets married in December of 1866. Um, he feels as though now that Blacks have been enfranchised, his role in politics should be over. He can go back to being a businessman. And the business that Dunn runs quite effectively um, is one of a labor agent. He works for the, the newly formed uh, Freedmen's Bureau. And what he does is negotiate contracts for freedmen. There were freedmen everywhere. There were plantations everywhere. Everyone needs labor. And what Dunn is able to do and what brings Dunn the vast fortune that he created was to uh, connect the planter with the formerly enslaved freedmen. And the freedmen trust him enough to allow him to write contracts for them. And he takes a percentage of those contracts and that is how he produces his vast wealth. Dunn hesitates in assuming uh, the nomination for lieutenant governor of the state. As I said before, he wanted to run his business and be a family man for the first time. You know, he's um, gotten married. Uh, his wife has uh, two children. Uh, one of uh, his nieces moves into the home. So there are actually three children in the home. And he wants to step away from politics. The individual who will change his mind is uh, an African-American orator by the name of John Mercer Langston, who would be speaking in the city of New Orleans 
at the convention, at the nominating convention, uh, at the same time. And he will go to Dunn's household and in hopes of convincing John not to abandon the nomination. Uh, and the reason that he's so convinced that Dunn should do this is because Dumas loses to Warmoth, his nomination for governor to Warmoth. And uh, Mercer Langston will argue, look, if you do not assume this position, then we're in the same position that we were in before. Um, white men will assume all the top jobs and we will be left um, just voting for white men. So there has to be someone that assumes this role. And in his biography, he said that he walked up and down Canal Street. And I don't know if many of you have been to New Orleans. Canal Street's quite a long street. Um, Dunn lived on the corner of, of Canal and Durbany at the time. And they would walk. Um, this is several miles. He walked up and down all night to the, early, the wee hours of the morning. And when they returned to Dunn's home, Dunn's wife heard them sitting on the porch uh, still debating this idea of what it meant for Dunn to be uh, the nation's first black lieutenant governor and how important it, it was that Dunn serve in this role. Overhearing her husband uh, talking on the porch, uh, she would listen in and she will agree with Langston. So she will, she will exit uh, the house and then begin to demand that her husband not you know, pass up this opportunity, demanding that it was his duty to do all that he could to elevate the race and that he had to run for this position. Dunn will run alongside Warmoth, even though uh, he and Warmoth are no longer friends, and they will form, uh, this is a poster from right after the election, and these are all of the black delegates that are elected in 1868 in Louisiana. Um, 18, uh, Louisiana will have an enormous uh, African-American presence in its legislature thereafter. And it's immediately after that they will pass uh, the civil rights bill that um, the legislature will pass the civil rights bill that Warmoth will uh, veto. The bill is often referred to as the Isabel Bill in Louisiana, and it's called Isabel, the Isabel Bill, because the delegates that bring uh, bring the bill to the House uh, or to the vote uh, are two brothers, the Isabel brothers, who are pictured in this poster. However, as I said before, Wormuth will veto that bill, and it will cause a schism in the Republican Party. In fact, the schism will divide the party into two sections. Uh, one section led by Dunn, called the Radical Republicans. The other section of the Republican Party will be led by uh, Henry Clay Warmoth. Uh, Henry uh, Dunn, a lot of people have probably never heard of Oscar Dunn, unless you re read my recent uh, book on him or read my dissertation on him there. Prior to the writing of that book and dissertation, there had only been three papers written on Dunn. Uh, Dunn is considered uh, in Louisiana history to be one of the most honest uh, politicians in Louisiana history. He was loved by Democrats and Republicans alike by the end of his term, and he will successfully unseat uh, Henry Clay Warmoth. They will impeach Henry Clay Warmoth, but just before his impeachment, uh, Dunn will die of mysterious causes many maintaining that Dunn had been poisoned by the Roarmouth camp and that he wouldn't assume, uh, denying him this ability to assume the position of governor in the state. Um, he's also the first African-American man that's openly discussed as a vice presidential candidate by a major party. And the party that's discussing his potential for being a candidate is uh, the Grant administration. So Grant, um, uh, the Grant administration are looking for uh, possible people to run alongside Grant in his second term. And one of the men that is suggested is Dunn, if he's able to overthrow um, 
the Warmoth camp. He He's able to do that. However, he dies before the impeachment actually takes place. I'd like to end the discussion there, open the floor to discussion. Um, if there are any questions about um, Dunn, uh, Warmoth, uh, voting rights, how these voting rights happen, 1866, Mechanics Hall riot, I'd be happy to answer any of those. So thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you, Brian. That was very interesting. I there was lots of intrigue too. It was it was very it was it Twists was and turns. It's Louisiana. Louisiana okay. has uh, had a very interesting uh, political uh, lineage for quite some time. Well, as Brian said, it is now time to take your questions. So if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and the comment section, and we will try to get through as many of them as possible. So to start off with, though, I have a question because um, you said that the African-Americans, that there was a majority of them. So like, um, what was like the there was, it seemed to me like a lot of African-American delegates. What was the ratio in the Louisiana legislature? Or do, you, uh, do you know? That's a good question. I haven't ever thought about the ratio, but um, it's important that you know that the if there is a lead for African-Americans, it's a very, very slim lead. So there are Democrats uh, in many of the parishes and one reason that we know that this is true was a tactic that Dunn has to do shortly after being elected to get the 14th Amendment ratified. Um, Dunn realizing that the margins are very, very close, he will introduce uh, a bill calling for Democrats to swear an ironclad oath. Uh, pledging that they will not rebel or rise up against the government, that they will uh, respect and serve uh, the administration. And many Democrats, being former Confederates, refuse. So this gives him the ability to have the majority of quorum. He has a, he has a quorum already, but he realizes, I can narrowly beat um, the Democrats if many of them withdraw from this ironclad oath and never take their oath of office. So he does this. Many of them do not swear in. He's able to call for a vote on the 14th Amendment and get it ratified without the votes of those Democrats because he has enough Blacks to have quorum. Mil wow. Political shenanigans. Yeah, but they, you got... You, you, and that, that's one of the things I always, when I talk about Reconstruction, that's very, very interesting because Reconstruction will be play, will be painted after, you know, during the Lost Cause as these very inept and not intelligent people. But Dunn was parliamentary law um, and Robert's Rules of Order and things like Dunn was an expert at these things. And he learned these things through his involvement with Freemasonry and the post- that he was able to hold both in the church and within Freemason. And he was an extremely shrewd politician, knowing when to compromise, knowing when to stand his ground, knowing when to fight, knowing how to concede things. And he had a vision for African-Americans. Um, uh, quite one of the things that he does that very few people know is um, Louisiana schools were integrated in the summer, in the winter of 1870, right after the, the Christmas break. So in the beginning, the January of 1870, after students returned from Christmas break, uh, he integrated schools. And he realized a lot of Black parents would be very, very scared to send their own children to schools with whites in these white public schools. So he realized that he had to take a stand. So he sends his children to integrate schools. So the first three uh, black children that integrate schools are his children. Um, and one of the things that people notice in Louisiana is there are lots of parochial schools. And the emergence of all those parochial schools really early is because of this early integration. So 
when you're asked when did school who integrated schools in New Orleans, quite often people look at Ruby Bridges. But no, in 1870, Oscar Dunn integrated public education in the city of New Orleans with his own children. Wow. That that is so fascinating. Okay. Um, here's our next question. Um, so the the guy who betrayed the, the whole group and became governor, but then didn't sign the civil rights bill. What happened to him? You left us with him getting impeached and then the, and then Dunn dies. So can you finish the story for those of us who want to know how it ends? Okay. The, the, you have to get the book because there are a whole bunch of twists and turns, but I'll, I'll give you some of the twists and turns in the book. In 1870, he will hurt his foot. He will be uh, dedicating a public works project on the river. He will put his foot, uh, he will be on a paddle boat and put his foot on the paddle in the paddle boat and his foot will get crushed. <laughs> um, he will then have to convalesce, but he doesn't want Dunn, who is his opposition to be acting governor. So he abandons the governor's post, but he pretends that he's there while he is convalescing in his summer home which is uh, in past Christiane in Mississippi. Well, Dunn gets wind that he's convalescing there and Dunn gets a locksmith to pick the governor's office, to pick the door. And he goes in and he assumes his role as <laughs> acting governor in the stay of, uh, in the stay of Warmoth being absent. And he does a whole bunch of things. So first, he starts appointing judges. <laughs> he starts appointing all these vacancies that are, are that are open with his people. Um, there's a international case, murder case that's going on in the city, and the murder case uh, involves uh, a Asian a sailor that is killed by two Europeans, European sailors on the port, and there was huge discussion over how fair the trial would be. Would the courts convict white men for killing this Asian sailor? And the, the court, the case goes to court and the courts call for the execution of these two Europeans that, is, that have killed this Asian sailor. And then the international arena gets involved. So the consulates contact Dunn and say, well, we need you to intervene and send these cases to the countries where uh, these individuals are natives, uh, sparing them these executions. And Dunn refuses to do that. And the, the, man, the men are executed. Um, and he said, you know, had I been a white man, then you guys probably would have respected uh, who I was and, and I, maybe I would have been free to act, but since I'm not, I'm just not going to act in this manner. And he, the execution of the two uh, foreign nationals that killed the melee and they call it a melee, um, uh, 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 sailor is allowed uh, they're allowed. Those executions are allowed to take place. Don also a uh, very notorious, <laughs> he, he frees a police officer that have been sent to prison for taking a gift uh, from people on his beat. And this gift was seen as uh, a bribe. And the judge and the prosecutor really wanted the, the officer released. It was a white officer. He'd been a good officer other than this bride. And they had um, sentenced him to jail and they were hoping that someone would pardon him. So Dunn becomes acting governor. Dunn pardons this individual and he's he's let go. But when Warmoth hears that Dunn is making all these changes and that people are liking the things that Dunn is doing and that this is winning him support in both the black and white community, he comes back on he comes back to the city from past Christian on a train on crutches. And, and demands that Dunn vacate the office that he's holding. And then has the police officer, who everybody, including the judge and the prosecutor, wanted freed, rearrested and thrown in jail and argues that Dunn had no right to 
uh, pardon him, even though he was acting acting governor at the time. So it's a, a hugely controversial period in uh, Louisiana history. 1870 would also be very violent. There is a metropolitan police force which done heads, and um, this com this police force is an integrated police force. So there are African Americans and whites on it, and then there is a city police force. And both of these men are in control of it. The governor in control largely of the city police force and Dunn in control of the metropolitan police force. And these police forces will quite literally go to war with each other, uh, having massive battles in the city of New Orleans. Um, uh, the governor will go to uh, radical Republican wards and arrest all the delegates and then have imposters come in and vote for them. So when we get to the convention, the, uh, the Republican convention in the city in 1870, there will be a split convention and, and they'll uh, call it the Gatlin Gun Convention because the convention will take place. There will be two conventions, Warmoth wanting to ensure that he controlled the venue and being wealthy from graft will rent every hall in the city believing that will force Dunn to have his convention in a venue which Warmoth controls. Dunn having the support of Grant, remember Grant had given him uh, the dishonorable discharge, <laughs> um, will give him the customs house as a place to have uh, the convention. So they will have, this will be called the custom house convention. And at the custom house convention, Dunn will be um, the leader of the Custom House Convention, and there will be more delegates at Dunn's convention, uh, which would have been a harpinger to uh, to Warmoth that, look, you probably going to lose the next election. So there's down and out war between these two individuals. Wow. Okay. So um, our next question, earlier in the presentation, you talked about I think it's like the Metropolitan Riot or the Metropolitan Hall Riot or the Mechanics Hall Riot. Thank you. In, Sorry, it's the, the Mechanics. The, in the, July of 1866. Right. So what prompted the firefight? I mean, was it just because they were trying to organize? Like what what prompted the firefighters and the policemen to like organize to destroy the um, first, the due process clause. You, you got to remember the 14th Amendment is the amendment that defines what citizenship is. The Dred Scott case had maintained that no African American, whether it's free or slave, could be a citizen of the United States or any state therein. So when the 13th Amendment is passed, uh, you have this huge population in the United States that has no legal identity. So first of all, we had to do something that would give them a legal identity so they could own, sue, you know, go to court. And the 14th Amendment is passed to do this. Um, there's also something in the 14th Amendment called the Due Process Clause, which uh, quite often uh, the 14th Amendment is associated with civil rights. And this says that you can't teach, you can't treat citizens differently, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnic origin, regardless of their religion, all citizens have to be treated equally. So very quickly in New Orleans, these delegates start saying, okay, well, we need to start, um, when, we're, when the 14th Amendment is ratified, we want to join all these clubs, we want to do, we want to go to the places where we're not permitted, we want all the rights that, that whites have. You got to understand how controversial that would have been in the deep south um this idea of blacks habitating white spaces and being treated like whites was more than what many southern whites could bear at the time okay and so that's what caused them to decide to riot and attack the convention exactly guess that makes sense. Interesting. Okay. So Dunn seems to be like a very pivotal person 
in Louisiana. Politics were helping to usher all of this in. Um, and you touched on it a little bit in your presentation, but what was his background in the sense of like, did he have any formal education or another fascinating story? If you read the book, <laughs> Don was <laughs> Don was born a slave. We don't know who his uh, true father is. In fact, um, one of the real revolutionary discoveries that comes from the research that I did was I was able to identify who owned him, you know, and who owned his mother. Um, so he, up until the 1830s, he is enslaved uh, until the age of nine. At the age of nine, his mother's uh, his mother was engaged in a relationship with a free man of color who comes to the city of New Orleans in the fall of 1819 and is working. He's a theater carpenter. He builds sets for the first American theater in the city of New Orleans. And he will purchase the family out of bondage from uh, a merchant by the name of uh, Bowers. And he will emancipate them within a year uh, before the police uh, jury. And when they're emancipated, Dunn has the opportunity to do something that uh, changes his life dramatically. First, uh, he gets a last name because slaves only have first name. So he, when he decides on what his name will be, he adopts his stepfather's first and last name. So he goes from being um, known on records as Oscar slave, you know, to Oscar James Dunn, uh, embracing uh, this freedom that his stepfather has purchased for him. Um, his stepfather, we know, was an illiterate man. He signed uh, contracts with an ex. And but he, he was um, wise in a number of other ways. He realizes the importance of education and his futures and financial successes match that of his employer. The employer, the impresario that founds the theater is an extremely famous man in, in New Orleans history. Um, his name is James Henry Caldwell. He comes from England, a very young actor, and establishes a network of uh, theaters along the Mississippi River and along the eastern seaboard and becomes very rich. In fact, he's also the man that brings gas lighting to the city of New Orleans. So he creates gas lighting, he opens banks, he becomes very wealthy. Um, James, uh, the free black man that comes uh, from Petersburg over with him, will uh, also, his fortunes will will grow. He'll open his own boarding house. Uh, he'll purchase land. And he's able to send Dunn to school. Um, and this was something that Dunn could have never done as a slave. Dunn embraces education. Uh, we know that he was an avid reader from a number of accounts. We know that if he had a choice, he would have done academic pursuits. Uh, and he goes to school until he's about 14 years old. At the age of 14, he's apprenticed to a plasterer, a master plasterer, and he hates the work, but this is a more realistic uh, goal and a more a steady stream of income uh, as, as, as an artisan in the city. Um, however, uh, he, uh, he we know exactly who he apprentices to. We know who he works for. He. Uh, begins working for a man by the name of Dryden. And Dryden had at one point been an opera singer in the city. Uh, and, and he sings at work. And Dunn um, becomes infatuated with music. And he begins first studying under Dryden. But he and Dryden have a big falling out. And he goes and begins apprenticing um, for music studies under an Italian master by the name of Torna. And Torna uh, teaches him uh, guitar, and he himself becomes a master and begins taking on pupils. And this is another controversial part of Dunn's life. He So he gives up plastering, he becomes a music teacher, and he loves it. He has all these pupils, he's able to play music, it gives him a lot of time to read. And then 
another free black music teacher, uh, will, his name is uh, Martin, will have an affair. And this affair will bring all the music teachers in the city of New Orleans under scrutiny. Uh, Martin had been having an affair with a pupil. And the pupil was a daughter of a wealthy white patron who had been a theater star herself. And he leaves with the woman's daughter and they begin living together. Well, some months later, she finds out where her daughter is and shows up with the police at his home. And he's shacked up with her and they have a brand new baby. And it's like, ooh, scandalous, right? <laughs> so this is like a huge scandal in the city. Um, but it gets worse. As they start investigating this guy, they find out that he was having affairs with all kinds of wealthy white women, married and daughters and everything. So they don't put all the women's names in the paper, but you can find out exactly who they were um, the way the newspaper does it. The newspaper puts the street they lived on in their initials. So, <laughs> so wow. they want that all the white men start gathering at Lafayette Square and they want to tar and feather him. However, um, the police won't let them take him. And Dunn sees all this happening and he's a music teacher. And quite mysteriously, they, they say, well, you know, we believe that he had accomplices that are also having these affairs. So Dunn very quickly gives up music and has to return right before the war to plastering, which he really didn't want to do. So as soon as the war ends and people are looking for labor, Dunn opens a labor office. And at this labor office, he realizes he can use his skill as an educated man to help write contracts and that he can derive some wealth from this. And he becomes extremely popular with the freedmen because they trust him. He had been a freedman himself. He's well healed. He's known by Masons. He's known throughout the state. And he's able to parlay this into a political career and wealth. Wow. That is a fascinating story. Okay. So I have two <laughs> questions as we wrap up, because probably someone else beside, out there besides me wants to know more about this. Um, Brian, what is your book's name and where can we get it? <laughs> okay. Well, I'll pull it out. Hold on a second. I did it as a graphic novel. If you want to read more text, you can always go online and shoot me an email. I'd be happy to send you a link. And let's see, it's a lot of glare. There you there. go, monumental. But it's called monumental. Uh, uh, Oscar James Dunn and his rag radical fight uh, in Reconstruction, Louisiana. Yeah, it's it's kind of substantial for a graphic novel, but it's pretty detailed. It's not like your average graphic novel. It's quite intriguing. If you want footnotes or footnotes and things in there, so you're able to see cool. the sources that I use and their glossaries and maps and all sorts of cool things. So if you visit the city of New Orleans, you want to see some of the sites that are very much attached to Dunn's life that are still there, you can. Okay. All right. So here's our last question, which we ask all of our um, guests on our show, um, which is a little off the topic of what you talked about tonight, but but still kind of germane because we are looking for Lincoln. Why do you think it's important in the 21st century to continue to study the life of Abraham Lincoln? Okay. One of the things that's really, and I'll connect it back to the story of Don, is African Americans, even in the city of New Orleans, trusted Lincoln enough to send delegates to him, believing that he could affect some change to improve their lives. They trusted him enough to send these delegates to him. And, and his notion that he accepted these delegates and met with these delegates prove that they read him correctly right. You know, they, they knew that he cared about their cause. They knew that he cared about the soldiers that served under him. And um, his last speech um, proves that, you know, he had uh, warmed to the position of having universal suffrage, uh, or at least limited enfranchisement of African-Americans, limiting it to 
um, people who were educated, uh, people that may have been free before the war, and people that had participated um, in the recent Civil War. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank our audience for tuning in this evening. And Brian, thank you much. It was it was a very fascinating talk. I, I found it very, very interesting. So thank you so much for joining us. And I wish everybody a good evening. Bye. You've had to let me know. I'll get you a signed copy over to you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.